Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's good to see each of you here today and to be here in time to worship together as in face-to-face uh, -face and group-to-group. -group. Um, everybody needs to hold their breath. No breathing from here on out. Uh, but it is good to see you here. It is good to be back. Just so that you know that we are broadcasting live uh, throughout this period of time. There has been a number of people scattered from the Philippines to New Guinea that's been tuning in to our services. So I thought, well, I'm just going to keep on going with that and reaching lives and touching people's lives. And several of my high school classmates have been tuning in because they realize, hey, Scott changed a little bit since high school. So I guess after 40 years, you do have, ought to be able to change somewhat. But it is good to be here. Uh, we're going to be singing together and worship together. But let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank you so much for all that you are. We thank you for your love and your grace and your blessings of life. And Father, today as we have come together to worship you, we lift up our hearts, we lift up our voices to bring you honor and to bring you glory. So, Father, we come together in your name, asking that, God, that you would move on each of our hearts and our lives the way which would draw us closer to you. Father, we ask your blessing on everything that is said and done, that it may bring you honor and glory. For we ask in Jesus' precious and holy name, and amen. Let's sing together. Good morning. We're going to start with page 446, Leading on the Everlasting Arms.
page 395. <clears throat> <clears throat> Hallelujah, I found him through my soul so long as crave. Once again, uh, it's one of my favorite songs because it just repeats just a step by step of the journey of our life and we come to Christ and the well of water ever springing. As we go to the Lord in prayer, um, there's various a different prayer requests that have been passed on to me over the last few weeks. So just remember to continue to pray for individuals. What I've tried to do anytime somebody's name or thought came in my mind about somebody, I just stopped where I was at and lift them up in prayer. I was telling Pierce a little bit ago several times throughout the last number of weeks, 11 or 12 weeks to do it all, that, that his name would pop up and I would just lift him up in prayer. And so I tried to do all that. As we continue to pray, I still continue to ask for prayers for my parents. We've been praying for them quite a lot. Um, and my daughter-in-law uh, is facing some ch more challenges and things. So we ask that you keep them in prayer. Continue to pray for Marjorie. You know, she was right in the middle of the process of um, getting the treatment for her eye that all of a sudden came to a screeching halt. Maybe it's all your fault. I don't know. <laughs> no, but, no. Um, but let's continue to remember her in prayer and the things that she is facing. We've been continuing to pray for Gloria and Albert over these weeks. And it's been challenging. Debbie's mother is recovering from yet another surgery. Um, 
a little over a week ago, and uh, she is uh, is struggling mightily. And so, appreciate your prayers for her mother and her father. Debbie and I, and my son, and my daughter, and, and two of our grandkids, we are leaving on Tuesday evening, driving all the way up to northern Michigan to spend just a few hours with her and, and her dad, and then we'll turn around and come right back home. So it's going to be a quick drive, eight, nine hours each way, and uh, spend a few hours, turn around, come back. So I appreciate your prayers for us as we make that journey, that God would watch over us and keep us safe. Um, there, like I said, there's so many families, uh, different individuals that have been faced with so many challenges over the last few weeks, and I think it's just good that we continue to pray. Well, I, I even challenge you, if you're standing in the store line and somebody's standing there, just ask God to bless me. You don't have to know their name. Just pray for them. Lift them up. Uh, when you see somebody, you see their faces discouraged, you say, hey, do you mind if I pray for you today? And just lift each other up in prayer. I, I, God's, God's blessing and God's wrapping his loving arms around us is, is what gets us through. And just because we don't know him doesn't mean that God doesn't know him. So we lift him up. In our denomination, the Church of Christ, Christian Union, they're in the middle of all this, making some decisions. Uh, this is the season of pastoral changes and things like that. And all this has been put on hold and and so many different things that's going on. So we appreciate your prayers for them. Our Ohio Christian University, uh, they're in Circleville. They're, we're in the process of making some major changes when this all started on and offering new course lines of study and graduate programs. And so all this kind of just slapped them in face. So everywhere we turn, there's been a lot of challenges and things. And then mostly let's continue to pray for our lost and unsaved loved ones those who are outside the Ark of Covenant, that God would reach out to them and use us to touch their hearts and lives. Let's pray together again. Our gracious Father, as we come to you in this time of lifting up the burdens and the needs of people around us, oh, what a great joy it is to know that we can come to you to cast our every care upon you, that we might find help in the time of our need. And so, Father, we lift these people that we may mention, my parents, Debbie's parents, our, great, our children. I ask the God that you just lift them and magnify yourself among them today. May they realize without a doubt your grace and your presence is so pure and so readily available. Father, we continue to pray for Marjorie. I ask the God that you be with her as she continues this journey for the treatment of her eye and and all the other things that surrounds her life right now. We thank you, dear God, for watching over her. Father, we continue to pray for Albert and Gloria. We thank you for what you've done for them over the last few weeks, how that you've met their needs, you've watched over them and cared for them and lifted them up and supplied the mental, emotional, and spiritual strength that they needed. Father, we pray for our college and our denomination through these changes and and adjustments that are made to uh, district councils and general councils and camp meetings and university courses, all these things that God, that people are handling and working through. We pray for wisdom. We pray that God, that you would guide them, that through the midst of all these things, that we trust you to work everything to the good of us who love you and are called according to your purpose. Father, we do pray for those of our friends and family that are outside the Ark of the Covenant, that are lost without hope. And we ask that God that today that you would reach down and touch them. We're not telling you to do something that you don't already do, but you told us to stand in the gap. You told us to lift them up to you, and that's what we're trying to be faithful in doing. And Father, I also ask that you would help us as followers of Jesus Christ, that you would use us for your glory, that we might fulfill the mission that you've given to us and that is to carry the gospel to all people. Now, Father, as we continue this time of worship, we ask that God that you administer to our hearts deeper and stronger than you have ever done before. That, Father, that when we leave this place and we go our separate ways, that we know that you have been with us and we have been with you. And these things, dear Lord, we pray in the blessed and the wonderful name of Jesus. And amen and amen.
Let's sing another song together. <clears throat> Page 437. What a glorious thought that that song gives to us. Blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I don't know about you, but I, over this period of time, I have gotten closer to Jesus as he watched over us and cared for us. And of course, the wind blows, the notes off, and everywhere around the world see me bend over and pick them up. Hey, that's something. I know. And so I'm glad that, that in this period of time that we can draw close to God. It, it's really our choice. God is no greater, no less, no more, no more sufficient than what he was before last year or last or March. It's up to us to whether or not we are going to tap in more of him. Somebody said, how big's your bucket? 
When you go up to the well of grace, do you go up with a, just a cup, a gallon, or do you go up with a tanker? Now, I like to go up, try to make myself go up a tanker. This morning we'll continue on with our uh, series of messages that I started a few weeks ago uh, in covering the idea and the theme of the spirit-controlled walk. And this is the third uh, part of that series. As we progress, you know, next Sunday being Pentecostal Sunday, or Pentecost Sunday, the Sunday which is used to celebrate the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. And so this, we've been building up to this, and we'll continue on this thought for another two or three weeks as we continue to look at this part about the Spirit-controlled walk. We're absolutely not able to cover it within a six-week period of time all that there is about the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit for our lives. Um, it was a two-semester course for me in college. And so um, we can go on and on for a couple years you want to, and we can find a way through that. But as we look at this, we're going to look at the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, starting at verse 17, and reading through chapter 5, verse 2, or verse 5, I'm sorry. Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 17. And we'll be looking at this, and we'll use this as a foundation, and we'll refer to it throughout the message. Uh, in your bulletin, uh, there is a handout that you can use to follow along if you wish, and you can fill out to try to help to keep um, yourself straight and, you, and follow up with other study, because I use a lot of scripture. And so this way you'll be able to have that scripture that you can look back on. Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 17, read out my Holman Study Bible. Therefore I say this, and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the fertility of their thoughts. They are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. They became callous and gave themselves over to proscumity for the practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more. But that is not how you learn about the Messiah. Assuming you heard of him and were taught by him because the truth is in Jesus. You took off your former way of life, the old man that is corrupted by deceitful desires. You're being renewed in the spirits of your mind. You put on the new man, the one created according to, the God, to God's likeness and righteousness and purity of the truth. Since you put away lying, speak the truth each one to his neighbor. Because we are members of one another, be angry and do not sin not. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil any opportunity. The thief must no longer steal. Instead, he must do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone that is need. No rotten talk should come from your mouth but only that is good for the building up of someone in need in order to give grace to those who hear. And don't grieve the whole God's Holy Spirit who sealed you for the day of redemption. All bitterness, anger, and wrath, insult, and slander must be removed from you along with all wickedness and be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as the Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. But sexual immorality and impurity or greed should not even be heard among you as it is the proper for saints. And coarse and foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable, but rather giving thanks. For you know and recognize this, no sexual immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of God, of the Messiah and of God. What a powerful portion of scripture. 
We'll be looking at this on and off over a couple more times because there is so much information in this foundational part. You see at the beginning there in chapter 4 that Paul, as he writes to the church of Ephesus there, he's saying, don't be this way like you were. Now, we have to realize that Ephesus was not a place of the Jewish beliefism. They, Ephesus was a place similar to what maybe New York would be, a port where everything come in. There was a great mixture of all nationalities and a lot of beliefisms inside of Ephesus. And Paul, as he addressed this group of people, the, the church there, the believers in Ephesus, he says, no longer be that way. He used the word Gentiles because at that time the word Gentiles and Jewish was, was the significance between, signifying between those that believe and those did not believe. He was not telling the Ephesians to become uh, Jews. He was saying, no longer practice the, the things in your life that you once were because that is not what you've heard about Jesus Christ. And then he goes on down and says, but let this be found in you. Don't let these things be here, but let this. We see that transition. Don't let this, but here's the opposite. Let it take place. And what Paul was walk, talking about here, he is talking about allowing the Spirit of God to control their lives, to make a definite distinction and change in their lives compared to what they were. And I believe that we as believers, that there should be a distinct distinction, difference between us now than what we were before we became Christians. And at the same time, Paul writes with it here, we see there is a progressive growth that takes place from the moment of belief until he gets down to the end, the inheritance that we have in Christ. Just because we become Christians is not enough. Just because we've given our heart to the Lord is not enough. There should be an in-depth desire in us that I want to grow. I want to mature. I want to be more what God wants me to be than what I was yesterday or the day before or the month before or the year before or the decade before. And I ask the question today to everyone within the sound of my voice, are you closer to God today than what you were last week, last month? Is there that desire to grow? Is there a hunger to know more about God? Now, when I talk about a hunger, now, we don't all hunger physically for the same thing. Uh, some of you know what one of my favorite things to eat is, is toasted peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. It has to be Jif peanut butter, and Blessed Debbie made me some more freezer strawberry jam. And so now I'm in heaven if that hunger taking place. Another thing that I hunger for is those little round white powdered donuts. Man, you just can't get anything better to have a toasted peanut butter jelly sandwich and white powdered donuts all in the same meal. And that's a hunger, but you might say, I don't like that. But there's still that craving, there's still something in our life that we want this particular physical thing in our life, this food. And so when I talk about our spiritual hunger, that there should be a desire that I need to know more about Jesus in this area. I need to know more about God's love in this area. And we create that hunger till we get to a place where we're digging in and finding what we need. The Debbie made the other day some uh, uh, spare ribs. And I was sitting, in, it was about midnight. And I was getting ready to go to bed. And I felt my stomach turn, and I remembered there was a few of them left in the refrigerator. So at midnight, I went and put them on a plate and put them in the microwave and feasted with barbecue sauce all over me, those ribs. And that just, you know, there was that craving. There was that thing that I needed. And there in my spiritual life, there are times where there's just this craving of something I need of God. And I believe that's what Paul was writing here. Feed that craving. Feed that desire. Use these things as measuring rods, as measuring points. I do some construction work. Just finished up last night my daughter's kitchen and putting new cabinet tops and cabinets in there and things like that. And there's one thing I did not let get far away from me, and that was my measuring tape. When I started that project, there was four or five measuring tapes, but I said my measuring tape is the rule of thumb. And if you've ever done construction work, measuring tapes can vary anywhere from a quarter to eighth of an inch, sometimes up to a half an inch. So it's always important to use the same tape to measure. 
And I believe this Bible, God's Word, is the only measuring tape for our life. It is not man's opinion, man's thought, is what God's Word says. That's the Spirit-controlled walk. And today we're going to look at the aspect of the holiness and assurance. You've heard it said that the only thing that you can be sure of is death and taxes. That is a hard philosophy to build your life upon. In fact, you, can be sure, you can't be sure about either one. You can't be sure that you will die, though. Hebrews tells us that an appointed man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. But that's all the assurance that you have about in this life. Even though the times and the dates of your birth certificate and death certificate are already recorded on God's calendar of events, the date and death of time are not known to you. The appointment of God. We need to keep that as a thought in our mind. Every day, God has an appointed time where we will stand before him. You go to a cemetery, you will see a great variety of appointed times. And we're not going to discuss that theological point, that doctrinal position. We just accept God's word as being the truth on that. I've stood by the bed of a number of people as they slipped from this world into the next, but I've never seen one of them that was conscious know that that was going to be their last breath. They always tried to bring one more, to have one more. Actually, the only thing that we can really be sure of, I believe, is our true relationship with God. I believe that, that we have a no-so, not a hope-so, or maybe-so experience with God. I know in whom I believe, and I am persuaded that he is able. That assurance in this life, as we go from day to day, moment to moment, task to task, we can be assured of our relationship with God. 1 John chapter 5, verses 12 through 13 tells us this. He who has the Son has life. He, do not, he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And so we're going to look at what are some of the signs of assurance? What are some of the measuring points? What are some of the, the, the I points that comes to and says, I know this is what I am. This is where I know it to be. The signs of assurance. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17 says, But as you continue in what you have learned and have become, become convinced of, because you know those of whom you have learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Well, today what I want to say is that there has to be a foundation a foundation that we have is God's Word. We're not going to debate that. We're not going to assume that something else could be just equally important. There's no other holy text. There's no other holy writing that will be significant for us to get to heaven on. God's Word is, is breathed by God, by God's Spirit, and it is good for training, equipping, and leaders, and we have to be established on that. So when we read what we did in Ephesians, where Paul says that let no vain talking or greed or hate or anger, all these different things that Paul listed, don't let these be found in us. We have to say that is God's breathed word for our lives. This is what God expects for our lives. And we have to use that as the foundation. Yes, people will come along and will give their opinion. My, my computer is filled with over 3,000 books, a man's opinion about God's Word. But when I look and really, I really want to know, I go to God's Word. Other man's opinions, the texts, the things that I would read, helps me understand. But if that book contradicts what I read in God's Word, that book is not believed. 
That book is, cannot be trusted. But I can trust God's word. And I know that is God's word. Because God inspired Timothy to write that his word is God breathed. And we have to hold that. So when we look at these things about the assurance that we can have the assurance about our experience of being sanctified. The word sanctified simply means set apart for God. Removed out of our life that which con con is contrary to God or that which causes us to stray away from God. That when we know that there are things that are contrary to the things of God, we need to ask God through His Holy Spirit to eradicate, to remove them, to pull them up by the roots. It's just like Roundup. Roundup's advertisement says it gets down to the bottom of the roots and kills the roots so it doesn't come back. And that's what the Spirit of God does as long as we let the Spirit of God work within us. It gets into the root of the sin and removes that and keeps us clean before God. That is the basis of what sanctification is. The Bible says when you ask according to his will, we will answer. So we ask God to, to sanctify us. We ask God to eradicate that. We ask God to take that carnal nature out of us. And what Paul, John says there in 1 John, there is this confidence that we have in approaching God, that we ask anything according to his will. He hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked for of him. God will answer that prayer for us to be more what he wants us to be. You have ever raised children? What have you done to help your child to grow? Everything physically possible. Everything that you possibly could do to help that child to grow. I want to tell you that God today will do everything possible for us to grow in him if we allow that to work within us. It is God's will for us to live holy in, in our life. First Peter chapter 1, verse 15. It says, Just as he who called you is holy, be ye holy also in all that you do. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, who, who, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but rejects God, who gives us his Holy Spirit. It's not Scott today that's saying that we must live a holy life. It's not Scott today that's saying that, that we need to have a sanctified life. It is God speaking. It is God's will. So what are the reasons that I have this assurance of sanctification? The first one is the desire of my heart. The desire of my heart. We were redeemed to be set apart from the world. Just as I made mention on there, you know when you're hungry physically. I don't know it, but you know it. You're the only one in all reality knows whether or not if you're hungry. A mother raising a small infant does not know that that baby's hungry until that baby says, I'm hungry, through a cry, through, a, through restlessness. And so we have to look, what is the desire of my heart? If you do not have, first of all, a desire to grow, you are not sanctified. You have not set yourself apart for God. Sanctified is more than just having God, forgive me of my sinful acts of the past. Sanctified is God, cleanse my heart for the present and for the future. Help me to grow. And I asked this morning, what is the desire of your heart? Are you seeking and desiring of God? Visions 1, 4 through 6, he chose us before that the creation, he has set us apart. He has proved this plan. He predestined us to draw closer to him. He has made the plan. He has made the provisions for us. Do you desire today? The second thing that I see within here, uh, scripture-wise, is that the way we know how uh, the assurance of being set apart or sanctified within our life is that our search for spiritual peace. It's one thing to be hungry, but it's another thing to search to take care of that hunger. When I get hungry, I don't sit on the couch and say, yeah, give me that peanut butter jelly sandwich. I have to get up, 
Walk to the kitchen, go to the counter, pull the bread out, get the peanut butter, get the jelly, get the knife, get the spoon, and put it together. Am I in the midst of my spiritual hunger? Am I searching for the spiritual peace that God wants me to have? Am I looking for that? I love hunting. Not been able to do it since my stroke and heart attack. But I love going out and hunting. I love the idea of tra tracking a deer and tracking the game and looking for that and searching for that until I find what I'm looking for. And folks, the journey searching for the things of God is fun. I love getting into God's Word. I love digging through the pages. I love looking at the words, searching for that truth, searching for that Word to help me to be more today than what I was yesterday with God. So I ask the question, are you hungry? And are you searching to take care of that hunger, spiritually speaking? It's our continual search for spiritual peace that is an indicator of our search for holiness. The peace that accompanies our sanctification is one of assurance that we have begun that life of holiness. Not satisfied or content to have what you currently have, but to have more in Christ. The peace is not self-generated. It is God is the source. John 16 verse 33 says, this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The peace that we have searching for God comes from God. It's not saying, well, pat me on the back. I read my Bible today. I pray today. But that, that peace that comes from God, that peace that passeth all understanding, that peace of, of just that deep settledness in our heart that nothing else can be explained except that it comes from God. That's the search for peace. That is the search for God. That is the search. The perfect peace comes from a perfectly cleansed heart. The only way to have a perfectly cleansed heart is to be filled with God's Holy Spirit and His sanctifying grace. It's just like taking a cup that you find along the riverbank that's filled with mud. You dip it in the river and you dip out that water and you take a drink of it. How many of us would drink muddy water? How many would not first try to clean that cup as best you could to have it clean so that when you dipped into the water that you would have a clean cup of water? I want to say, folks, that, that we cannot have peace by seeking it and doing it ourselves. We cannot have peace by just reading the Bible more. We can't have peace by just being kinder. The peace that passes all understanding, that cleans us, cleans us and helps us to grow, is the peace that comes directly from God. Fill me, dear Jesus, with your spirit, that I may have your peace. I get that from John chapter 14, where Jesus says, The Holy Spirit will teach you and guide you into the things that I have for you. So when the Holy Spirit moves in our hearts and lives, it's not just the Holy Spirit, but it is the things of God and Jesus Christ that fills our life. It helps us to be more. The third thing that I sense and I see in Scripture that helps us with our assurance of, of a sanctified life or a life that is after holiness, our testimony. Someone committed totally to God is one whose life obviously, ob ob Obviously, get it out here, shows it that there is no doubt in the fact that this person is with God. Have you ever been around somebody and you just get this sense that this person is a Christian? You never met them before, but just the way they act, the way they look, the way that you just sense deep in your heart. I know I've come to that, and there's been times when, you know, sitting in a group, and, I, and somebody says, Scott, you're a Christian, aren't you? Yeah. I never told them. There's been times I've sat in a group, and I looked at them and said, and on the side, I said, you're a follower of Jesus Christ, aren't you? And so many were, yeah. There's that, just that unity. There's just that testimony. There's just that their obviousness. And I believe the way that we live, that we live what Paul writes, inspired by God in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, 17 through 5, verse 
chapter, chapter 5, verse 5, all those lists, if we live that way, it will be obvious that we are a follower of Jesus Christ and that we allow the Holy Spirit to infill our life. Folks, there's no way you and I could ever do what Paul was inspired to write here in these verses if it was not for the Spirit of God working within us. There's not a single one of us that could ever be angry and not sin not if God was not there to help us. I don't know about you, but I was a very violent person. I'd rather smack you upside the head than say, bless you when you sneeze. I would slap you upside the head, why did you sneeze for? I mean, I, I, I was mean. I was angry. I, I would rather beat somebody up than to say, hey, be my friend. There was more joy in that. Before I surrender my life totally and completely to Jesus Christ, I would be blown out and just get this rage and want to tear people apart. But since I allowed the Holy Spirit for my life, that anger has subdued. I still get angry. I still have this rage at times that builds up, but God's the one that puts me in this box and controls it so that I don't lash out, that I don't revolt against. And all those other things that Paul writes within there, even the Holy Spirit is the one that can only help us to live a testimony that reflects what God expects of us as Christians. So I ask the question, how's your testimony? You examine your life for a moment. Look back how you respond. Look back in the things that you do and the things you say and the things you think. Do they reflect God? Stephen was martyred for his faith. His dying words mirrored the commitment of his heart. And we find this in Acts chapter 7. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. There was a distinction about Stephen that caused people wanting to kill him. But that distinction made him see Jesus in the roughest and the hardest time of his life. His testimony was so powerful and so strong that the people said they, they, they plugged their ears because they didn't want to hear it. Just because people don't want to see it or hear it doesn't mean that we cannot live it and we should not live it. We must let our light shine. A sanctified, sanctified heart displays the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, 22 through 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have been crucified the sinful nature with its passion and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. In this display... There is assurance that God has cleansed the heart from the works of the flesh. He is God who sanctifies holy. The fourth thing that I see that helps the reason to believe that I can live with a sure life of sanctification is my, our encounter or my encounter with biblical truth. When's the last time you read God's word to feed your heart? Not out of a sense that I've got to do it, but I want to do it. I really want to do it. I want to know more about God. Encountering with biblical truth. Do you know more about God's word now than you did a year ago? You see, we can read a book. Now, I went to college. I read a book just to pass the test and forget what's in the book. It used to be that I would read God's word just because, oh, a preacher's supposed to read God's word and, and that's it. So I can stand up and say, I read God's word this week. But in my heart now, that when I look at God's word, digitally or in the physical form of that, is that that encounter with biblical truth, that when I get done, I just say, wow. I just met God. I just spent time with God. I read his word. You ever sit in the presence of somebody you just want to listen to and hear and talk with them? When we pastored in northern Michigan, there was this guy. He didn't, wouldn't come to church, but he knew the stories of all of all that area. Uh, Pleasant Valley was that. It used to be called 
hard scrabble and uh, scrabble and knock knock some hard scrabble and barn. Hard scrabble and barns. It was an old lumber company area. It was rough people. He lived there from a child in the same home, and he died in that home. And I love listening to tell the stories of that area. Shame he passed away without writing the story down. It's just that getting there. I love going and talking and having a conversation with my dad. The other day, James stopped by the church. You don't know how much that meant to me to spend that hour just sitting talking to you. But folks, all of those things are not as good as being an encounter with biblical truth. I want to spend time with God. In Thessalonians, there Paul writes in verse 3 and through 8 of chapter 1, he lists the traits of a consecrated heart, a concentration of their life. The work of faith, the labor of love, the patience of hope, the obedience to the word, the joy through affliction, their exemplary life, their witness of the gospel. Paul states these are all the things that we can encounter as we spend time with God and his word. So what are the steps necessary or important for this journey of holiness? How do we get there? First of all, I believe is that believers must know what sanctification is. You can't be something if you don't know what something is. Ever gone to work and some and your boss hollers at you because you didn't do something, you step, scratch your head, so I didn't know I was supposed to do that. I think we all probably have at some point or another. I believe we need to know what God expects of us so that we can be what God expects of us. If we don't understand or we don't have a comprehension, at least in a lower level, there's no way I can do that. I can measure, I could have put those kitchen counters and stuff together by saying, okay, here's six inches. But what if the next day I didn't quite spread it out far enough? Or spread it out even further? Or my right hand is bigger than my left hand. And so what if I use my right hand instead of my left hand this time? How much of a mess would I make? You see, we need to know what God's expectation is. And folks, the only way we can know what God's expectation is, is through his word. So I believe that the first step of sanctification is getting into God's word. Understand, seek what he expects of us. The believers must know what sanctification is. The word sanctify means to set apart for holy use. The work of grace that sets us apart to be holy completely of God. It is something that God does within us and for us. It is not something we can do on our own. It is the work that God does within us in response to our consecrating of ourselves to him, asking in faith that he, first of all, would cleanse our hearts from that rebellious, sinful nature, empower us to live holy in service, prepare us to live, a, uh, to live in a holy heaven. It is a spiritual dynamic that helps us to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, with all of our mind. And it's the Lord that makes us increase and abound in, toward one another in love and to all so that he might establish our hearts blameless in holiness before our God and the Father and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I take that out of the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6 and out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. It is not Scott saying what this is. It's what God's word says it is. And if I ever go to a place that this is what sanctification is and you can't find it in God's word, forget what I said. That's the reason why I use scripture. This is where I find the foundation. The second of all thing that, uh, skip over a few things, but the second thing that we can do to understand what sanctification is, we must believe that God will sanctify us. We must believe this is God that will do it. When we come to Christ and ask him to fill us with, be filled with the Holy Spirit, we must believe that he will deliver on his promise. We must believe in our hearts that he is and will do what he has called us to do and to be. I place an order for an item. I expect to receive that item. 
It's not going to be like Amazon that sends us the wrong thing. It's not going to be like the kitchen at the restaurant that brings us the wrong food. When we go to God and God alone say, God, sanctify me holy, fill me with your spirit, we must believe that God will deliver upon his promise. Uh, it, it's simple as that. It's not something we have to beat upon and dig around in the mud of life to try to find. We just go to God and say, God, here it is. The only time that it is hard is when we will not surrender. That's when it gets hard to find the sanctifying power of God. Being wholly, completely sanctified is the so total, complete surrender of our life to God doesn't mean that God's going to call you off and send you to an unknown place in this world to, to be a missionary. God's going to use you exactly where you're at, what you are, to do what he needs you to do and to live the way you need to be. Folks, do you realize there are more lost people around us than what we really could reach if we were sent as a missionary to Africa, New Guinea, Dominica, that you can reach more people for God today where you're at than if you would be sent off somewhere else. Every day, statistics says that we influence seven people. I know you've heard me say this different times. So the question is, out of those seven people you influence, do you influence them for Jesus? It might be only two today, but it might be 12 tomorrow. Well, on the average, every day of your life, Seven people is influenced by your life. What a great opportunity to be a missionary for God. Influencing people. And so we believe that God will sanctify us to help us to rejoice, to pray without ceasing and giving thanks and not to quench the spirit, to test all things, abstain from every form of evil is what we read in the scripture there. Verse 23 of, of, of chapter 5 there of Ephesians tells us that Tells us that how God wants to equip us to meet these standards. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, your soul, body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the one who calls you is the one who is faithful to do it. Definite and assuring experience. The journey of holiness. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12. I know whom I believe, and I am convinced, I am persuaded that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him. The assuring experience, the definite work, comes because we entrust ourselves to God. Do you trust God wholly and completely? If not, you need to start. And it's a growth process. I trust God more today than what I did 10 weeks ago, 12 weeks ago, 6 months ago. But I know there's still more trust I got to get. I got to grow. I can't become stagnant. In our spiritual life, in our spiritual journey, if we become stagnant or complacent, we're actually going backwards. It's like not getting a raise, cost of living raise, at your job. Not only did you not get the 3 or 4% raise in your income, but the economy will jump up 3 or 4%, so actually you're taking in 8% less than what you were the year before. So you're actually going backwards when you think you're staying the same. Don't be content where you're at spiritually. Don't be content that there's not that definite and assuring experience in your life. Our responsibility to, is to consecrate ourselves. The response of our heart is to seek holiness. Maybe over a short time or an extended period of time, you will receive a light with many source, a sermon, a Bible study or a song or a Christian book or the counsel of a Christian friend. The important thing is we have to walk in the light that we receive from God, regardless of how we get it. We need to know that you're born again. That's the first step. 
If today was the day that you had to stand before God and give account of your life, you have a full assurance that you would make it to heaven. That's what being born again is. That's what being saved. That's what the forgiveness of our sins is. That's the starting point. Just like a baby is born from the womb, we are born from the womb of sin and given birth into spiritual life. And you grow. You've got to start with the birth. Do you know when you're born again? The second thing to know or to, to, to have this de definite and assuring experience is to be open to the leadings of the Holy Spirit. Are you willing, whatever God says to you, to obey? That's a big step, folks. That's a big one. You know why? Because there's a war against your soul. The devil is doing everything he can to pull you away from God. Don't fight the devil on your own. Surrender yourself to the Holy Spirit. Let him do the fighting for you. I learned that lesson hard. I thought I could handle this temptation. I could handle this situation on my own. And I found out quickly I could not. So God, I have to surrender to you. I have to allow your spirit to fight. Acknowledge that need in your heart. Acknowledge it. It's not something to be embarrassed about. You know, one of the hardest things that I see as a pastor over the years is to see Christians to surrender. I've seen people grip in the back of the sea when I preach a message about surrendering and, and open the altar for a time of prayer. And they just kind of sit there and they fight that. I don't, I don't fully understand that. But I've been there. I've done it, so I can't say shame, shame on you. All I can say is, when you surrender, it's good. When you allow the Holy Spirit to overpower a situation in your life, to cleanse your life from that situation, boy, it's good, folks. It's better than a toasted peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's somebody making them for you and making the toast just perfect and putting the right quarter of an inch of peanut butter and the right ten spoons of jelly on it. And bringing it to you. Acknowledge the need in your heart. Then we acknowledge that. Surrender. Surrender everything to God. Surrender and consecrate yourself to receive his fullness. The unsanctified heart is consumed with itself. Intent on having its own way in all matters. Fifthly, receive my faith, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Be born again, seek God, acknowledge the need, surrender everything to God, and then receive it. Ever gone to the bank to ask for a car loan? Probably all of us have. And the banker says, okay, here's the check. I was just asking, I don't really want it. And you walk away. And you get your old car that barely runs, say, man, I wish I had a new car. How foolish would that be, really? We come to God and say, God, I have this need. I have this spiritual struggle in my heart and my life. And so, God, I acknowledge it. I know you're the one that can give it to me. I'm coming and telling you about it. I, 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 I'm really, really going to surrender to it because I'm telling you I need it. And God said, okay, here it is. He said, oh, never mind, God, I'll go my own way. How foolish. How dangerous. How can we resist if we don't take what God has for us? How can we live the way God wants us to live? We must believe that God has done the work. I'll read this scripture again to you. In closing, and I want you to think about it as I read it. Therefore, I say this, Paul is writing here, and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as Gentiles walk in the futility of their thoughts. They are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them 
and because of the hardness of their hearts. They became callous and gave them themselves over to proscumity for the practice of every kind of impurity with desire for more and more. Well, listen here, starting verse 20. But this is not how you have learned about the Messiah. Assume you have heard of him and were taught of him because the truth is in Jesus. You took off your former way of life, the old man that is corrupted by deceitful desires. You are being renewed in the spirit of your minds. You have put on the new man, the one created after according of God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. Since you put away lying, Speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are all members of one another. Be angry and sin not. Let, do not let the sun go down on your anger. So if you're mad at somebody, forgive them before you go to bed. And don't give the devil an opportunity. I love that one. I got that one boldly underlined in my Bible. Don't give the devil an opportunity to work in his power in my life. The thief must no longer steal, but instead he must do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. Not only just the physical, but the spiritual. No rotten talk should come from your mouth, but only what is good for the building up of someone in need. The only time you should look down at someone is when you're reaching down to pick them up in order to give grace to those who hear. Don't grieve God's Holy Spirit who sealed you for the day of redemption. Verse 31. All bitterness, anger, and wrath, insult, and slander must be removed from you according with all of its witness. And be kind and compassionate to one another Forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. And we can say, ouch, that's a hard one. But God expects us. And I found that God never asks us to do something he's not going to help us to do. Therefore, verse 1 of chapter 5. Be imitators of God as his dearly loved children. We who raise children... It's fun to watch them do something that we do. I love that one commercial on TV where the mother takes her daughter to work. Everything that the mother does, the daughter does. Pretends like she's on the phone, folds her arms, sits back, pushes the button on the elevator, all those things. And the mother just smiles with great joy. Folks, I believe that God wants to smile on us because we imitate him. And walk in love. As the Messiah who loved us and gave himself for us. A sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. Verse 3. But sexual immorality and impurity or greed should not even be heard of among you. As it is proper for the saints. And coarse and foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable. But rather giving of thanks. For know and recognize this, for we know and recognize this, no sexual immoral or impure or greedy person who is idolater has an inheritance of the kingdom in the, of the Messiah of God. The word idolater there means allowing things to be more important to us than God's perfect will. Anything that is more important to you then perfect surrender to God is something you worship. And the Bible tells us at the very beginning of our response to him, have no other gods before me. Holiness and assurance. I'll say this, I believe it to be mandatory. Not an option, but mandatory surrender of ourselves. So I close with this question. Where are you in your spiritual journey? Are you growing? 
Are you surrendered? Are you surrendering? Will you surrender? Where are you at in your journey? Let us pray. Gracious Father, as we come to the end of our time together, I pray that God, that your love and your grace will surround each one of us in a way that we know without a doubt that we are children. And Father, as we realize that we are your children, we also realize that we need to grow. So Lord, I pray not only just for myself, but for everyone within the sound of my voice that we would make a decision today to grow in you and to do whatever is necessary and whatever you desire of us to be imitators of you. God, let that be our prayer. Let that be our desire. Let that be our action. Let that be our motto for our life that God, I want to be more like you because we understand that there are people around us that are lost. And if our testimony does not fully reflect you, how can we really show them who Jesus is and his purity and his love? Now, God, I realize that there are struggles in each of our lives. There are times when we falter in our walk. But, God, I have found that when we are surrendered to you, that when those times of faltering, when those times of struggle come, you bring it to our mind and we quickly say, okay, God, I need your help here. I can't do it myself. That is the sanctified life. The removal of that bent of rebellion against you and your things. So God, I pray that you will pull the roots up out of my life and all the lives of everyone here so that God, that we can be holy as you are holy. Now, Father, I ask your blessing on everyone that is here, everyone within the sound of my voice. Bless their homes, bless their lives, bless their families, and bless all that they do. We pray in Jesus' holy name, and amen. May God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you until we meet again. Go with God as God goes with you. Amen.